are watching this today. Um, as Dave said, my name is Tony Woodruff. I'm here to talk to you about decoding compliance in Teams. Um, let's get started. So before we get before we kick off, I uh, just want to say thanks to the sponsors uh, for making uh, this happen today. It's fair to say that it wouldn't uh, events like this wouldn't happen without them and the and the organizers. So a huge uh, thank you to uh, them as well. So a little about me. Uh, I'm a premier field engineer uh, with Microsoft based in the UK. Uh, I work with customers that are migrating from Link or Skype for Business uh, to, to Teams. I've worked with Teams probably since the, the start of the product in terms of when it launched on uh, the Office 365 uh, Admin Center. My background is I've been in the space Link, OCS, Skype for Business for many, many years. I uh, was a Microsoft Certified Master in Link 2013 and I've got some telco background as well uh, for 15 years uh, with uh, the traditional telephony all the way through to uh, the latest generations as we as we have now. And my background in, is been purely in Microsoft for about 20 years having started, I think it was on Windows 3.11. So uh, some of you I know will uh, go back even further than that. So we've got a action packed agenda today. Uh, I've got 43 minutes to get through this, which is great. So I'm going to talk to you about why compliance is important. I'm also going to talk around the building blocks that we can use around uh, your compliance journey. Talk about what's available for teams, which is obviously why everybody's here. Look at some scenarios that we'll play through and I'll talk through uh, why uh, certain components may help. And then then we'll we'll look at a, uh, a close out. So I wanted to start with this quote from Paul McNulty, who's the uh, former Deputy Attorney General of the USA, which is, if you think compliance is expensive, try non-compliance. A lot of companies think of compliance as just, oh, well, we've got to do it. it you know, we'll, we'll not fund it uh, as much as, as we'd like. If we think about the, the evolving threats and the evolving scenarios we see today, Let's look at GDPR. That was a huge wake up for the compliance community because they had to to essentially meet it. If we think of information leakage, you know, if, if you're compliant and put the necessary controls in, some of that information leakage may not happen. If we look at cybersecurity, again, if you have those controls and you and you regularly check them, some of those incidents may not always happen, you know, or could be avoided. And then the other one is around insider threat. That is an ever evolving thing um, that many organizations aren't quite aware of um, and it's something that in the Microsoft landscape we have been uh, developing for but I won't be talking about that in this specific uh, session today. <clears throat> so why is compliance important? It's fair to say it's important for, for operating. Uh, proactively complying with compliance uh, rules essentially enables you to do business. And if we look at the compliance rules, we have global, regional and even internal legislation in your organisation. Being compliant and being prepared reduces risk. You know, as I said, you'll see regularly on, on online websites, um, news websites and technology talking about litigations that happen or security incidents. So being proactive in this space can help reduce those risks. One of the other ones around compliance that's really important is actually the surge of data. You know, if, if we think back 20 years, a one terabyte hard drive, you would never have thought you'd needed it. But in fact, we are dealing with, you know, petabytes and more now, zettabytes of data every single year. And we don't always manage that data properly in terms of manage, you know, deleting it. Uh, classifying it and there's some of the things that I'm going to talk to you today about in this presentation. So one of the common questions I get from customers is how can I be 100% compliant and in reality there isn't an answer or there isn't one single answer that I can hand over. It's several building blocks all working together to be part of a solution and the compliance space is constantly changing and it can be a struggle to keep on top. So by taking those building blocks that you have, you can build a potential solution. For those of you that like Lego Star Wars, there's a potential solution. Many thousands of, uh, of, of building blocks, but you can kind of see the drift of where we're going. Take those building blocks, review them, check that they're applicable, and then create something um, that's going to help you. 
So if I think simplistically about compliance first, it's actually a few things that we all we all essentially share. We have a physical compliance requirement, so if we think about where we host data, it could be a desktop under a machine, although really recommend against doing that, or it could be on a USB stick, or it could be in a data center. Having physical compliance around access security, around people being in the building that should be in the building, having controls around who's accessing it, why they were accessing it, what they were doing are really important because whatever compliance requirement or whatever security solution you put on your platform, if somebody's physically got a disk or they've got physical access to the server, it's only going to be a matter of time before they get in and get access to your data. So start at that, that physical layer and, and think about how you're going to understand that. Data residency. For those of you that are M365 admins, you will have seen this come up time and time again. Where is my data? It's in this cloud thing, but where actually is my data? Is it within a data residency? So if, what I mean by data residency are things like sovereign clouds or regions. You'll, you'll see Azure has regions of where you can deploy uh, IaaS, PaaS and SaaS. But if we think about Office 365, there could be your tenant could be in Europe. Your tenant could be in the UK. It could be in the US. It could be in Germany. And it's about understanding where that data resident, you know, where your data is essentially resident on which servers, uh, as it were, or inside which data centers. And there has some there's some legal um, and compliance requirements that are there too. Uh, and it's worth thinking about those. If we then look at the retention of data, spoke about it just a second ago. But if you have an explosion of data and some of your data is from 10 years ago, do you really need that? data from from all that time ago. How how many times are you accessing it a year? How many times are you accessing it? At, you know, if you, so go back as far as a decade. Retention of data is a huge compliance requirement in terms of getting rid of data that you no longer need. And if you've looked at GDPR, you'll see that as a classic example. That could be procedures. It could be customer data. It could be anything. And it's worth thinking about that as part of your building blocks and decoding the solution as we go through. The other one around compliance is actually security. Uh, having the correct security controls in place to keep your data and your environment and your users safe. If you have got a, a, a base tenant, you won't necessarily have all the security controls that you would like. They could be things like uh, ATP. Uh, let's think of some others, conditional access. There are a multitude of different engine. There are a multitude of different things there that are essentially there to help keep your data secure and we'll talk about a couple of those a little later and finally audit being able to audit who has got access to your data at any one time is massively important because you can essentially see what is going on and who is doing certain things with that information because if you've ever been involved in a security incident like I have over the years having those audit logs are really important so that unified audit log that's in office 365 Feel free to turn it on if it's not turned on already. You'll be able to see everything that's going on. You know, if you're an exchange administrator from days gone by, it will be mailbox uh, audit logs. But unified audit logs take it to the to the next level in terms of you know everything that's happening in your environment, including AAD sign in logs. And if you one thing you'll see at the bottom there is if you've got a question. Uh, join me on the breakout session at the end. If you type your question into the box, um, we will. Uh, I'll ensure I pick that up in that breakout session as well. So if we look at some of the example compliance regulations, and there are many out there in the world, they essentially break down into worldwide regulations, regional regulations, government specific or customer specific, and then industry regulations. So I take ISO 27001, worldwide recognized standard, international standards organization. It's a worldwide information security standard and many companies go after this because it's a badge of honor. It enables people that do business with you to be confident that you're gonna look after data about them. GDPR, everybody knows about this, it's fair to say, because we all have to, we've all seen the pop-ups appear on the website saying, you know, we're allowed to process your data and all that kind of thing. This is a this was one that rocked the compliance landscape and many tool sets were created to be able to deal with data subject access requests. Deletion of data, you know, if you've been involved in that, you'll get the drift. 
government is an interesting one because you could I could almost label this customer as well. If you're working with certain entities or certain customers and you're hosting their data, you may have to achieve their standards. If you think of gov.uk, there's a G Cloud. Um, if, if we think of the US, there could be ITAR, there could be a multitude of different um, government specific uh, compliance regulations that you have to meet before they'll even do business with you. And then moving on further down into industry, PCI, payment card industry, making sure that you are taking payments and if you're holding on to data about payments, that it's compliant, that you're removing it after a set time. You, you may have called uh, a contact center and uh, provided your card details over the phone. There'll be a number of physical requirements uh, that are in place there that the agent taking that doesn't have the ability to note any of those details down. There may be uh, the fact that their Windows desktop, they can't open up a notepad to take things, or they may say, please hold a moment. I'm just going to, uh, you can put your card details in now, but they can't hear the tones. They can't see what you're putting in. These are all solutions that have been put in to be compliant with regulations such as this. If we look at why you're all here, so what's in the Teams toolbox? It's fair to say there's a uh, a multitude of different things. I'm just going to take these uh, nine to start with. And if we start on that code journey, we actually want to see how we're doing already. And this is where compliance score comes into play. Compliance score is available to you in the Microsoft 365 Compliance Center. It's in public preview. And as you'll see at the top there, this service is currently previewing subject terms and conditions, which you can go and read if you wish. But it talks, it, it's essentially about simplifying that compliance journey that you're on and reducing risk. It continuously monitors those controls that, that ultimately you, uh, you're, you're wanting to work towards. And you'll see this theme, we've got productivity score, we've got secure score. We're, there's all of these tools available to tenant administrators and other roles in the organization to see how, how you're doing and, and, and plan changes to, to essentially make things things better. The one thing I like about this tool is that you can split it into solution areas. So if you do have somebody that looks after SharePoint, somebody that looks after Exchange, somebody that looks after Intune and somebody that looks after Teams, there are solution areas that you can effectively let them go and have a look at. But the one thing to really point out in all of in all your use with Office 365, some one change you make over here may make may make a change to the behavior of another application especially with teams you know it's the looking glass across office 365 and it's about understanding that change over here could implant uh, impact over here and and that's a that's one of the big tips that i would give you so if i move on from compliance score and i look at the uh, assessments there's actually something called compliance manager and compliance manager is available on the service trust portal which enables you to go and create some assessments based upon things and compliance regulations that you're you're wanting to meet. And you can go to servicetrust.microsoft.com to, to, to get there. But the thing that's nice about this is if you create a template in Compliance Manager, it will flow through to Compliance Score. So we've got that one view that we've got, you know, we can see everything that's going on. Now, you can leverage our back for this. So if you have somebody in your org that it's purely there for compliance. Their role is compliance. You can give them an RBAC role so they can come in and have a look and they can keep track of this because as an IT admin, you're constantly juggling so many different things. But if you've got somebody that manages compliance for you, let them have a look. Let them go in and, and, and look at the actions and the control information and see what needs to be done next. One of the tips from me in the field uh, where is work with the compliance team and utilize that RBAC, which I've just uh, essentially spoken about and, and, and see where we, you know, start that journey on, on of decoding. So put that one back in the toolbox. Let's have a look at labels and naming. So labels uh, enable you to classify um, and date, you know, groups or, uh, and, and also assign sensitivity to data. So we have a feature that enables us to set up classification labels and apply them to Office 365 groups. So you can see on the demo there, I've got, when I create a team, which I did for Commsverse, you can see there's a classification that appears, highly confidential, confidential or general. That can be applied to the group and it will flow across everything. So when if I set up a SharePoint site, those classification labels will be there. If I set up a Power BI 
uh, workspace, they'll be there. And what I can do with those is I can run some automation that says if there's a highly confidential group, I don't want anybody to allow guests to be added. Um, and that's that's a huge foundation. The same with sensitivity labels on data. You can use Microsoft Information Protection to apply file level controls that you you know ultimately utilize RMS on the on the um, back end to say that if I upload that highly confidential document by mistake into a team with a load of guests, if that guest open tries to open it, they're not going to be able to open it because the RMS client's going to go. Now you haven't got permissions to do this. And whenever you look at these um, tools, my biggest tip to you is taxonomy. Now, if you don't know what taxonomy is, it's essentially the, the structure of your labels. Easily understood labels with fantastic explanations and examples are an adoption success. And some of the customers I've worked with, including when I was a customer, you, you get lost with all of the cool features it does and you burn time because what you should have done is rather than IT defining all these labels, go to the business. The business, if they have an information retention policy or knowledge manager, work with them, help them be part of the journey and, in, and get that taxonomy there because then all you're doing as IT is you're an enabler. Naming policies is another one uh, that's built into Azure AD. A different, uh, there's a requirement on certain license types for this. But you can create a group naming policy that means that people can't create groups with certain words in CEO as an example, um, maybe some other bad words. And you can control those in the AAD admin center or via PowerShell um, against your tenant. And that's it, it will affect uh, the tenant wide. One thing that's really nice is you can use attribute based uh, prefixes or suffixes or put a string in. So as you can see on the screen there with my demo, I'm just putting GRP next to it. So every group that's created will have GRP and some people like that for a nice clean gal or admin view. But again, that's up to you. A common implementation worry and, and ticket that I've seen is I'll have somebody come to me and say naming, naming policies aren't working for me. And the reason behind it, if you are logged in as a user, the global admin, group admin or user admin, this will just wash over you. It won't be effective. So when you're implementing this, make sure you think about that and have a test account. So we'll put that one back in the toolbox and then we'll have a look at retention. Retention policies, they are a, a huge area of compliance and I've spoken about it already with GDPR. Retention policies enable your organization to manage that explosion of data. By default, we keep everything in Office 365. And as you can imagine, if you're looking at SharePoint storage and email storage, and everything, it starts ratcheting up over time. Now you can configure your retention policies via PowerShell or the compliance center. So in my demo I'm showing here, I'm creating a compliance policy and targeting teams. So it will remove the chat messages after 30 days. Some organizations have requirements where they only want to have it one day. But the thing to bear in mind is it's not instant and there's a background process that will run to essentially uh, to clean up this data for you. Some key fundamentals with retention policies when you think about them is one, understand the impact. Two, preservation always wins over deletion. The longest preservation will always win as well. Three, the explicit inclusion wins over implicit in terms of the locations that you define and the shortest deletion period wins. Now, when you set up retention as a whole, you can apply labels as well to 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 essentially define against those certain pieces of document uh, those document uh, the, the certain types of documents. Hey, this is an accounting document. I need to keep this for 10 years. Apply this retention policy to it. Another tip from me from the field is. Have you got an information retention schedule? Work with the owner to define the policies. So it's essentially the business making the decision around the data going and understand the impact. Look at conditional access. There's another tool that's available for Teams. So it's built in Azure Active Directory again. You can create rule sets based upon conditions and apply controls to, you know, to somebody logging in to that resource or that application. Where's this great for compliance? With guests. Guests everybody worries about, but if you put the correct controls in, the worry comes down a little. 
So if we look at use, uh, it's useful for enforcing terms of use. Again, that's a specific licensable feature, but I can put a document on there that when my guests come into Teams or they access one of my resources, it flashes up uh, an intermediary page that says, you need to read this document that's legal, it's signed by the lawyers and it's legally enforceable between us both, that you're gonna interact with us and interact with our data in a specific way. Other ways you can use conditional access are session timeouts. So you can make somebody log in every day uh, to stop those long running sessions. And you can also use it to enforce experience controls. You may want to block somebody accessing the full desktop client of Teams as a guest and they come in via the web. You may want to enforce MFA. These are all things that can be configured through conditional access. The one thing to think about from a Teams perspective as a top tip is remember that there is a service dependency hierarchy for Teams. What do I mean, what do I mean by that? If I have some rules that apply to Exchange or SharePoint Online or both, and my Teams rule is a little bit la you know, lax in terms of you know, this, the Exchange and SharePoint ones are a bit more stringent, when I log into Teams, I'll, you know, we'll evaluate all those rules and it will go, hang on a minute, Teams uses Exchange and SharePoint. Yeah, I'm not going to let you in because you haven't met this, this control. So again, think about that. Tip in the field again, see this as I go through, try to have as few conditional access rules as possible. I have worked with customers that have 300, maybe more, and it becomes a bit unwieldy trying to find which rules are applying. And you can have multiple rules applying at the same time and it becomes a bit of a mess. We have some tools available called what if to evaluate against a specific user if you're trying to fault it. And we also have report only. So when you create a, a conditional access policy, it will actually just show you what it's going to do without actually enforcing it. So we'll move on to one of my more favorite products other than Teams, of course, Cloud App Security. Cloud App Security is a more premium feature in Office 365 E5 but it is a phenomenal piece of, of tooling for compliance. Cloud security is what we call a CASB. You may have heard of a CM as well, which uh, is something like Azure Sentinel, and there are various different other products, McAfee, et cetera, out there. Um, and the Cloud App Security as a security broker essentially enables me to apply policies to users or, or, you know, or tenant wide. And as you can see in this example that I'm showing you here, I'm automatically applying a sensitivity label. Where's this, where does this work really well? This works well if I have a specific thing that I'm looking for. So it could be uh, we work in the financial sector, so it's got customers' uh, financial details in, it could be the healthcare sector, it could be, in my case, a very uh, sensitive project called Project Hendrix. And you can use the uh, the data types to actually get Cloud App Security to scan your documentation, your documents that are held in um, in SharePoint and OneDrive, and it will do what you essentially want to do with that. So, in the example on the screen, I actually got it to automatically apply an Azure Information Protection classification. And what I did was I uploaded this file to a team with a guest in. I don't want that guest seeing that really important uh, file, being able to essentially see what's going on with that project. So with, with Cloud App Security, when they upload the file shortly after, it will scan it and it will go, hmm, hang on a minute, I need to apply a classification label here. I can also configure it to remove, um, remove sharing links as well if somebody shares from a OneDrive to one of our competitors. There's a multitude of different things you can do, even with activity policies as well. So I can monitor specific users if there are perhaps a compliance risk. One of the other hidden great things about this, this is you can use this tool to evaluate software vendors. So you can actually go and have a look at a list of thousands of apps and it will tell you, are they ISO 27001 compliant? Are they GDPR compliant? When did they last have a breach? And it gives you a nice view for you to make a decision because we've all been involved in RFPs and, and when software purchasing decisions where well, we have to do the legal bit. And Cloud App Security has a nice way of investigating that for us and also showing alerts. So it will, it will flag alerts to you. You can see on the screen malware detection um, and you know for that, that naughty user that hadn't applied the um, sensitivity label properly. Because all the components in Office 365 are together, just remember that if you're trying to create a sensitive information type, 
and you go in here to set up the rule beforehand, and you haven't created it, it's going to take some time to replicate across. So that one's gone away. Let's have a look at data loss prevention. So data loss prevention has been around quite a while uh, in some of the on-prem products and uh, even uh, Exchange, etc. But it works to prevent inadvertent or intentional disclosure of data. We can use it to apply policies based upon some certain uh, sensitivity types. You can see on the screen there from this screenshot, we actually program a load of those in for you. So you haven't got to sit there writing regexes and various different other complex rules when actually it can be centrally managed. So if there is a new uh, PII information type, we, we as Microsoft will update that for you and, and it's there, it's, 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 it's applying and, and evaluating. DLP policies can apply to a number of services. So you, we obviously want it to apply to Teams for chat and channel messages, but it now also works for private channels and it's configured via the compliance center as you'd expect. It can work with custom data types. So I configured that Project Hendrix one with regexes. And you can, you can, as I say, apply these really quickly to those different components inside your Office 365 environment. One of the tips from me in the field is ensure you test and monitor this first, right? Because when you select those locations, as you can see on the screen here, and you ask it, what do you want us to do with that sensitive information? Oh, I want to show policy tips. What actually can happen is a user rings in to the help desk. Hang on a minute, I could do this before. What's this thing? Have I broken something? Manage that adoption curve, right? Ensure that you monitor it, test it, even try it with a pilot set of users and then expand it out because that message is pretty scary. This one is quite scary as well. But with this one, I can configure it so I can let somebody override and send the message, but I want them to tell me why, or I want them to tell me as an admin that it's not behaving as, as how I intended. So following the data loss prevention family, uh, we've got information barriers. Behavior is slightly different in terms of it's trying to stop uh, essentially communications inside your org. And it's built on this, this, this notion of segments. This was a relatively new piece of functionality that we launched, but it's, a, it's hugely powerful for the financial services sector for education, for legal, government, the list goes on. And what it essentially enables us to do is group our users together and say, I don't want the investment banker segment talking to the financial advisor segment of my organization because there are compliance rules and legislations there on, for example, insider trading or other things that, you know, other rule sets that target that specific function of my org. The thing that's nice about this is I've set up these segments, okay? Teams will respect them and I can target users based upon attributes. So if somebody does move from the investment banker segment across to the financial advisor segment, I don't have to go in and manually remove the user and scratch my head which group it's called and all these other things. By updating the data in Active Directory, if you use um, some uh, HR software to do that and downward feed, it will it will reevaluate the policies for me. When you implement this, you actually have to create a new Azure AD security principle. So ensure that your AD team, your security team are aware and you're happy for that to happen. So if we look at how this essentially works, I'm applying this policy to that investment banker section and they wanna uh, dial the financial services folk. Teams chucks up this message. Sorry, company policy prevents you from joining the call. If I then look at, I want to talk to a user that's in one of those, I'm in one of those restricted groups and I want to talk out to another group that may have some policies assigned. I have blocked via policy screen share. So you'll see at the top in the red box, there's no screen share. I then look again. I recently was speaking to Alan in my old uh, role. I changed roles and now look what's happened. I can't talk to Alan anymore. And I've and Teams has reevaluated that policy and disabled the chat. I can't do anything electronically to talk to Alan via Teams. So that one goes back in and we'll look at expiration policies. Single-handedly, this is my favorite feature for getting rid of the noise. 
Many of us, if you've been involved with teams for quite some time, you're in 20, 30, 40 teams, maybe more, depending upon how uh, happy people are at creating them for what you're involved with. Group exploration is part of AAD, uh, Azure Active Directory. It enables us to effectively validate the groups that people are creating. And as you can see in my example, I'm going into the groups on Azure Active Directory. I'm then clicking on expiration and then I'm defining the time period that I want the group lifetime to be. One feature that's really important is if you have people that leave your organization and they've got groups there, but the owners exist, uh, they disappear, sorry, you can get the system to email the, uh, the contact for groups and say, yeah, hey, we've got all these groups with no owners. They're going to expire very shortly. Do you want to reassign them? One tip that's really important with this is start small. So as you can see, I was I was targeting a specific group just to see what the behavior was like. Again, make sure you explain to use your users how it's going to work. Explain what they need to do. One other thing is if you this this will apply to all Microsoft 365 groups. If you create a group in Teams. You will get a notification in Teams. If you create the group elsewhere, you'll get the notification in email. We will typically notify 30 days, 15 days, and then one day before the group evaporates. Now, if the groups evaporated, what's going to happen? It actually goes into a recycle bin um, for another set time, uh, or if you've got retention policies, um, the way you're actually wanting to keep the data, we may keep it a little bit longer. But again, think about how this is going to impact the user journey um, so you get the very best adoption and compliance isn't a chore to them. So carrying on on the home straight now. Supervision policies. This is a relatively new one as well. You may have certain users that you want to monitor the communications that they're doing. This essentially enables you to meet some ethical or corporate behavioral compliance policies around how people use the service. And it helps you identify legal or risks in behavior. And you can then go through it. And as you can see here in this example, we've got Lee, who's a bit of a rogue, likes swearing quite a bit. You can configure policies where that will actually show up and you can annotate, you can resolve, you can tag it in an incident or you can escalate it and you can deal with that behavior head on by having the system effectively monitoring all of this for you. Again, has huge benefits in the financial sector education perhaps as well, especially right now with COVID, but it can be targeted to Exchange Online, Teams, Skype for Business and some select third party apps. There's a list on Docs which you can go and have a look if you want to have a, you know, see whether the uh, supervision policies or communication compliance can be used to help. And with our voice hats on and our headsets on, call recording is another compliance requirement. We recently uh, enabled this uh, in the team space via some APIs. Many of you may have done this previously with Skype for Business, but it enables us to record calls for compliance purposes. If we think about contact centers, financials, or financial sector or traders, they will have legal or organizational requirements that say, got to record this call and keep it for 60 days, 90 days, 180 days. Now, Teams has a four layered approach. A recording taxonomy. We have convenience recording, which we all use today. One to ones recording a meeting if, if it's enabled. We have functional recording, which is more around empowering a feature. So uh, e.g. a live event or some transcription. We've got organizational recording, which talks about that stuff that I've just mentioned around risk management and compliance requirements. And there's also lawful intercept as well, um, which some organizations do have to use sometimes. So we're talking about call recording, functional organizational lawful. How do we how do we do that? Today it's offered by several certified partners and this is growing all the time. The thing I want to point out to you is each solution has unique implementation instructions with requirements. Some of those requirements can be a virtual machine or an application. And when you create this service in your tenant or in your Azure Active Directory, you will need to set up some permissions so that it can read against graph. Again, 
put your security hat on. Somebody may not like that. You might have to run that through as part of the as part of the project life cycle. But just have that in mind because it's additional it's additional overhead in terms of management. It's additional overhead in terms of cost. So just have all of those 